Um, very warm, warm welcome to our panelists and to all uh, participants in the panel. And I hope uh, that um, we, are, we are right now 30 uh, uh, participants in the panel, but this number will grow as we as we go along with uh, with the panel. So um, it's um, we have witnessed that over the past two decades, diverse bottom-up and top-down memory politics and remembrance practices have evolved in Southeast Europe. Uh, they are constitutive of uh, collective memory that is situated largely within national frameworks and characterized by diver diverging accounts of the past, contested symbols and representations in the public sphere. Against this backdrop, the panel will discuss the dynamics and patterns of memory politics and remembrance practices in Southeast Europe, but more specifically, we will focus in, uh, the, in post Yugoslav spaces. Uh, the conversations in the panel will center around three broadly, broad, de broadly defined uh, questions that include uh, the first one is how does the past continue to live in the present and how it shapes the politics of memory and remembrance practices today. Second, what are the main trends of memory politics and remembrance practices? And the third question, how has memory activism shaped the politics of memory and in what way it has contributed towards the creation of a shared vision for the future? We have distinguished uh, guests in our panel and I'm very uh, happy to introduce them to you. They are uh, Anna Milosevic, Vieran Pavlakovic, Naum Trajanovsky and Venera Chochai. Um, let me give you a little bit of introduction uh, about our uh, guests and panelists. So I will start with Anna. Anna Milosevic is a postdoctoral researcher at the Leuven Institute for Criminology. Uh, she completed in, in Belgium, she completed a PhD on Europeanization of memory politics in Croatia and Serbia, and ha has published extensively on collective memories identities and European integration of post-conflict societies with a special focus on coming to terms with the past. She co-edited volume with Tamara Trost, Europeanization and Memory Politics in the Western Balkans in 2020. And her current research examines the roles assigned to memorialization processes in relation to terrorism with a view to critically assess their effectiveness for, for the victims, survivors, and societies at large. Welcome, Anna. It's a great pleasure to have you tonight. Vieran Pavlakovic is an associate professor at the Department of Cultural Studies at the University of Rijeka in Croatia. He received his PhD in history in 2005 from the University of Washington and has published articles on mem cultural memory, transitional justice in the former Yugoslavia and the Spanish war Civil War. Recent publications uh, include the co-edited volume with Davor Paukovic, Framing the Nation and Collective Identity in Croatia, uh, published by Rutledge in 2019, the controversial commemoration Transnational Approaches to Remembering Lipur in Politiska Misa 2018, and the Yugoslav Volunteers in the Spanish War in 2016. He is currently the lead researcher on the Memory Scapes project as part of Rijeka European Capital of Culture in 2020. So welcome, uh, Vieran. Naum Trajanovsky is a PhD candidate in sociology at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology at the Polish Academy of Sciences. He holds master's degrees in Southeastern European studies and in nationalism studies. He was affiliated with the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity and the Faculty of Philosophy in Skopje. Uh, his major academic interests include memory politics in North Macedonia and sociological knowledge transfer in Eastern Europe. His most recent publication is the monograph, The Operation Museum, The Museum of the Macedonian Struggle and the Macedonian Memory Politics. Venera Chorchai, welcome now. Venera Chorchai is a PhD candidate at the European Institute, London School of Economics and Political Science, her PhD research is part of a larger scientific research project entitled Justice Interactions and Peace Building from Static to Dynamic Discourses Across National, Ethnic, Gender and Age Groups, funded by the European Research Council. 
Her research focuses on wartime sexual violence and the gender-based violence in Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Kosovo. Welcome, uh, Venera. So before uh, starting with hearing the presentation of our, our uh, panelists, I would like to uh, give a couple of technical details. So we are, um, the panel is broadcasted uh, live on the um, uh, YouTube channel of, uh, of RECOM and also on the Facebook of RECOM. Uh, we have uh, interpretation is provided uh, throughout the, the panel for the Albanian to English, English to Albanian language, and also to uh, Bos uh, Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian uh, to English and vice versa. Uh, if you see in the screen interpretation, you have the uh, languages listed, but they, we have here English, German, and French. Uh, so uh, for if you, some of the participants um, in the panel would need translation, then if they speak in Albanian and would like to have a translation in English, then they have to uh, press for German. So German as for channel is for the Albanian uh, language and French for the Bosnian, Serbian and Croatian, uh, Croatian language. So this is a very uh, technical uh, detail. And also while, uh, when we hear the presentations of our panelists, I think uh, those um, pan guests in the in the panel and participants who would like to have uh, to engage in the discussions and conversations, they can raise their hand. Uh, they can talk. Uh, they can use it, put their cameras on when they talk, or they, if they decide to not to turn their camera on, that's fine too. Uh, if they decide not to speak but to pose the question via chat. That is also uh, will will do. So it's just up to you to decide what would be the best way to engage with uh, with uh, uh, the panelists and the discussions and conversations around the, the topic of today's uh, today's panel. So uh, now, without uh, further ado, I would like to give floor to Anna uh, to pre to present, uh, and we are very looking much forward to hear from. Uh, the, uh, presentations of our, all our uh, panelists. So, Anna, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vyalca, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak today um, on this quite important topic. So, um, briefly, uh, today I'm here in this conference practically in a twofold role. So, uh, on the one hand, um, I want to say a few words about the Memory Studies Association Regional Group that uh, I'm co-chairing with Naum and, and Vieran, my dear co-chairs <coughs> in, the, in the working group uh, on the Southeast Europe. Um, and secondly, um, I'm also here as someone who has been working extensively on uh, memory politics in the region, especially in the region of the, the Western Balkans. And as you said, Vyalca, uh, at the very beginning at the, at the, the, the short presentation that you gave about my work, um, actually, there is this new volume that I co-edited with Tamara Trosh that actually deals with uh, the effects of Europeanization on memory politics in the Western Balkans. So I would like to talk uh, more about this. So maybe just like um, a, a short uh, few words um, about the, um, the regional group that we have on the Southeast Europe uh, that deals specifically uh, with the memory uh, of the region. It's a newly formed uh, regional group within the Memory Studies Association. It's our small COVID baby. Uh, so we kind of conceived it uh, during the COVID time and we are um, uh, now trying to grow a bit. So we have also a website. Um, I don't know how to use chat on Zoom, but maybe somebody can, can share the, the, the page um, of our uh, website where you can get all the informations. Um, and secondly, yes, what I wanted to uh, speak about today actually are some of the ideas that uh, guided Tamara and myself um, and our authors uh, in the edited volume while working on the topic of Europeanization of memory. So this is quite, a, I think, a new approach to the politics of memory in the Western Balkans, to the countries that um, effectively have a shared past uh, but are living separate futures 
and might have a future together um, again in the, in the European Union. So what we actually looked in this uh, book uh, in 10 empirical chapters, but also in the uh, theoretical um, uh, uh, introduction uh, that we wrote together, is actually how European integration has affected memory politics in the Western Balkans. So uh, we look at the countries, seven countries that are in different stages of the European integration process, asking whether on the European level, there, there is something that we can call European memory and whether in the process of European integration, the process of Europeanization of uh, these countries, we can see some kind of changes. And if we can see some kind of changes, what changes um, these are. So um, this was quite a process and it was quite challenging. And I did it already um, examining uh, Serbia and Croatia uh, more in detail because this was a topic of my PhD thesis. But with this edited volume, we could give um, an analysis of the effects of Europeanization in seven countries, seven countries um, of the Western Balkans. So the main, let's say, um, finding of um, our research uh, is actually that there is no such a thing as a European memory. There is no such a thing as European memory. There is uh, EU memory politics that is a product of continuous negotiation between member states about what Europe was, what Europe is actually at the moment, and, and what Europe um, aspires, uh, aspires to become. So this EU memory politics is shaped by historical experiences, by identities, and of course, by political interests of its member states. It is a politics of memory. So what we looked in this volume actually uh, was what were the positive and negative consequences of alignment with these EU memory politics. So maybe I should say a few words about uh, what I mean when I say actually EU memory politics. So uh, over the time we have observed on the European level on transnational level that there is such a thing emerging that we can call EU politics of memory. It's the way that member states upload their historical experiences on European level. They seek acknowledgement of their experiences. They seek recognition of those experiences. And these were the most salient um, after the 2004 enlargement to Central and Eastern uh, European countries. What we had before 2004 was actually this kind of general understanding uh, consensus between the Western European countries that you know there was a war and this war ended and there was a Holocaust and it was an event that um, was uh, felt over all over the world. And this is something that should not repeat ever again. So we had this kind of like a consensus um, that the war ended and then there was this common understanding that by working together, by believing in peace, we can move forward. So what actually happened in 2004 with the EU accession of Central European countries is this, uh, let's say, um, investment that those countries made in their own national politics of memory to uh, kind of a certain So what I also uh, uh, examined on the EU, EU um, level, <clears throat> I don't know, my internet connection is unstable. Lo yes, we, lo we lost you for maybe yeah. a couple of seconds, yes. So what I observed on the, on the level of the EU and transnational level is uh, how certain European institutions uh, are dealing with uh, historical experiences of their member states. And I look at um, how this EU memory framework is constructed. So what I mean by this is that I have seen how the member states and the representatives of member states, especially in the European Parliament, promote certain discourses, narratives, and views of the past. And these are uh, most visible in the resolutions made by the European Parliament, whereby this consensus between the East and West, which is a simplistic, um, uh, view of the past, but this kind of simplistic view of the past was constructed within the European Parliament and then translated into policies that were enacted by the European Commission, for instance, in different kind of programs and funding initiatives that seek to find some kind of 
consensus and repacification um, of relations between the East and the West, between different kind of uh, views of the past, especially after the 1945. So this EU memory framework, um, as I call it, um, has been in a certain way exported to the countries that seek to become members of the European Union. So these countries, such as the countries of the Western Balkans, but also Ukraine and other um, countries with this kind of uh, aspiration, uh, they're trying to kind of uh, emulate the, the EU identity by aligning uh, with EU norms of remembrance. So what we have looked in this book is actually in what ways countries and political representatives of countries in the Western Balkans are trying to do that. So how they are aligning with EU norms of remembrance. And we arrived to a conclusion that this is a selective and very um, tactful process. So that the countries of the Western Balkans, in order to show that they belong to Europe and their European countries, they selectively uh, uh, take experiences and policies um, that relate to the European past and they downloaded international politics or memory. So through a number of uh, studies that are present in, um, in our uh, edited volume, we can see different kind of, um, uh, different kind of uh, alignment uh, within the countries um, of the region, depending also uh, of the stage that the country is uh, at right now uh, in the process of European integration. So to, take it, so to make it really, really brief, uh, countries that are most advanced in the process um, are trying to emulate the Holocaust norms of remembrance uh, by, uh, for instance, um, enacting the politics of regret by creating museums that uh, align with this kind of um, European Holocaustal uh, norms that exist um, in Europe. But what I also do, they download this kind of anti-totalitarian narrative that has been um, quite, quite present and quite, quite dominant on the European level. And what I mean by this anti-totalitarian narrative is that the fact that all totalitarian regimes, regardless um, of, of the origin or the ideological uh, orientation are put on the same level. Uh, a number of authors have wrote about this. Uh, I don't want to uh, repeat what they have said in the past, but fundamentally through a number of resolutions by the European Parliament, it has been established that there is this rejection of, anti -total uh, of totalitarian regimes, of um, anti-Semitism and xenophobia, and it is represented through a number of resolutions that have been downloaded in the countries of the best Balkans. Now, what happens is that political actors that actually advocate for this kind of um, download of European uh, memorial norms, they do it for their own personal interest and in political gains, but also to gain this kind of um, a symbolic um, uh, capital, I would say, um, but also to um, to make their road on the uh, towards the EU more more short by emulating actually this um, uh, kind of uh, this aspect of um, European memory. So um, I think I will stop there because otherwise the conversation is really really long. But looking at um, every country uh, specifically, but if there are any questions afterwards, I would uh, be very glad to um, respond to them. Maybe by looking in specifically in certain case or certain country or certain aspect of of this process. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Anna. Um, it's really important to perhaps later on to decode a little bit more, you know, these dynamics of simply uh, patterns of simplistic views about about the, the past, and also how and in what way um, the memorial norms or me memory norms um, of the European Union have been transposed in the in the context of Southeastern Europe and more specifically, uh, uh, for example, uh, Serbia, Kosovo and uh, and Croatia. So yes, thank you, thank you very much, and um, we will come back with questions on 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 this uh, later on as we go. So uh, Vieran, um, the floor is um, is yours. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Vyoltsa. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be on a, such an esteemed panel with some good friends also. Uh, I mean, this is a, 
as Anna mentioned, it's an important topic. It's a big topic and you gave us uh, uh, a lot of um, material to work with. So, uh, you know, probably some people on the on the panel or on the uh, on the Zoom call have seen some of um, parts of this presentation in the past, but I thought I would follow your structure that you suggested and try to answer the questions that you raised in, in the in the little information uh, brief you gave us. Uh, so I'm starting off with this image of uh, this year's commemoration in uh, Yasenovats, which after several years of being divided was brought back together again. So it seemed even despite the this uh, COVID commemoration or commemorative culture, uh, the things were kind of getting back to being normalized, but actually uh, very soon after this photograph was taken, I think uh, there was already some divides among the political leadership in Croatia. Nonetheless, I, I think I'll give you a quick overview what I think some of the, um, the uh, aspects of commemorative culture are in Croatia. I focus mostly on Croatia, not all of Southeast uh, Europe. And then what some trends are, these uh, the impact of memory activism, and then wrap up with maybe some changes that uh, did happen this year. So uh, for four years, I was following uh, a lot of these commemorations, both from World War II and uh, the Croatian War of Independence or the Homeland War as it's called here. Uh, five from the uh, Second World War and then two from the 90s. And we were looking actually at these institutionalized narratives, narratives but also what uh, I've mentioned here, they're the intertwined narratives of the Second World War, of communism, the legacy of communism and the war of the 90s. And I think this is the case for uh, pretty much all of the former Yugoslav um, countries in various uh, levels. I think it's particularly strong in Croatia, maybe also in Bosnia Herzegovina, and then uh, in, to different strengths in the different uh, countries. But especially in Croatia, I think you can see how these blend into each other. Uh, so, what are some aspects of this memory culture? I think there is this legacy also of silence and suppressed memories since 1945 not just of the Second World War, but then also what went on under communism, but then also in this new post-1990 countries, also a difficulty in necessarily openly discussing all aspects of it. So each state and each period was seeking to impose its dominant narrative. And this is reflected in the public space through educational curriculums, through the political discourse, popular culture, and so on. Secondly, I think these Wars, because they serve as these foundational state building events, whether it was socialist Yugoslavia or these independent countries, this is uh, the memory of the war and the memory politics are so, they're almost imbued with a sort of a sacred moment. It's very difficult to challenge these sometimes in an open democratic way. And the third is this blurring of these distinct historical periods into one national narrative. So what happened to Croats or Croatian 45, we can see that repeating itself again uh, in the 1990s uh, and these other aspects of, you know, the blurring of the past and the present, or I guess more correctly, the blurring of multiple pasts. And then now it was no longer uh, a pan-Yugoslav resistance movement in the Second World War, but then these individual Croatian or Serbian or Slovenian interpretations of it. And one aspect uh, during field work, uh, we noticed also uh, at the uh, commemoration in Kanin of Operation Storm, these symbols and shirts celebrating Blywood, which is also, you know, fascinating and somewhat uh, disturbing and the use of these images and symbols. So this was, uh, especially the, the team as we were doing the field work, noticed this on multiple occasions. I think also, also it's important is to identify these mnemonic actors uh, who drive the memory politics in Southeastern Europe. Here I'm focusing on the, some Croatian ones. This is a, an interesting photograph from uh, the Brezovica commemoration in 2015, where you really had all of these guys and, and ladies and women sitting um, kind of together. It was the, the last time that uh, president at that time, Kolinda 
Grabar Kitarovich came to this commemoration, but different political groups were using the commemorations in different ways and through their commemorative speeches. And that's what one of the uh, aspects that we focused on uh, was to see how different politicians and political elites used commemorations. Uh, and when uh, uh, my colleague Benedict Paddock used cognitive linguistics, you could actually see uh, the words and the way they spoke about the past could be grouped actually in sort of uh, um, maybe uh, communities of remembrance. You know, different political actors spoke in different ways at different places. And you can just, but the, the words they chose can be grouped. So this is an interesting way of seeing how memory is constructed because a lot of times, uh, you know, citizens will not attend multiple commemorations. Usually you just go to the commemoration that's most ideologically close to you. Uh, it's only a slightly crazy scholars who attended all of the commemorations. And so who are these participants? You know, we were really also looking and how is this narrative or these narratives, are they being transmitted? Who are these people who attend these commemorations? So there's all kinds of people there, but then also we saw disruptions. I mean, this was uh, for Croatia in the last five years, almost every commemoration that we had been observing were uh, disrupted in some way, whether it was the multiple uh, commemorations of Yasenovac, whether it was the multiple uh, columns uh, of memory in, in Vukovar, whether it was protests, whether it was a counter commemoration. Second World War, the war in the 90s, it was so uh, politicized and divided. And not only for internal Croatian relations or relations within Croatia, it's also with the neighbors. And I think this is an interesting image. These are two curators, one from the official uh, Yasanovac uh, memory site in Croatia and the other one at Donja Gradina, sort of staring off at each other with these numbers. And we can even see that how we interpret the past has an effect on the bilateral relations and different interpretations of the past and official institutions trying to establish either or, or even a third version of what uh, the past was. Uh, and since not everyone is going to these commemorations, we have the media. They're, you know, what do they choose to report on? What is the image they use? What is the, the title? Uh, you know, again, I think only the people on my on my research team were reading all of the newspapers and all of the, the electronic media, not to mention uh, that. So we have this second level uh, uh, transmission of these memory events. Uh, and then of course the actual monuments and what they, speak about, and uh, I'm not going to show you 8 million uh, images of monuments, don't worry, uh, here, but it, it, all of our, these former Yugoslav countries have engaged in new building, and the building of new uh, monuments uh, of various sorts, some more abstract than others, uh, and the process, which I think, again, varies from country to country, but this process of erasing one narrative, one past, or destroying it, vandalizing it, transforming it, and then building a new set of memorials. And not just to the 1990s, but to the uh, reinterpreting the Second World War with you know, questionable aesthetic uh, characteristics for these. We can you know, discuss about that as well. Or the symbols that are in the public space, whether it's the symbols from uh, the previous regime or attempts to install new ones uh, that are very obviously alluding to fascism or other problematic uh, ideologies. And sometimes these monuments move. Uh, this was a controversial monument several years ago in, uh, in uh, Yesenovac dedicated to these uh, this Hos soldiers who died in the 1990s uh, with the very controversial Zadom Spremni from the Ustasha movement on the monument. The compromise was to move it 20 kilometers uh, to another site, but that site, by the way, used to have another partisan monument on it, which is an Akostrinitsa, an ossuary, which was then destroyed during the war in the 90s. So it's this crazy multiple layers of memory sh attempts to shift the monuments, but not really addressing the issue. And the, some of the issues are these symbols. And in Croatia, there was a, um, a, uh, even a commission to deal with these uh, images and 
uh, the conclusion of this commission was Ustasha symbols and this horse Zadom Spremni is unconstitutional, except sometimes it, it is constitutional and sometimes you can use it. So we haven't really moved forward with it. And you know, what is a fascist symbol? Uh, this is also an interesting question uh, related to, let's say, the Bleiburg commemoration, because how do Austrian police then ban symbols or don't ban symbols? So what are some of these, th th these trends? Um, well, the state uh, has used commem commemorations to frame the dominant narrative. And this depends, uh, and this is regardless of which political group is in power, they have just chosen different commemorations to emphasize, whether again, it's the Bleiburg commemoration or maybe a Senovats uh, or something else. And there's these new national or maybe even nationalist interpretations. Um, you can even hear, uh, President Zora Milanovic and Yasenovac also emphasizing the, the Croatianness of the partisan movement and so on. Uh, and these commemorative practices and culture really is divided, not just ideologically, but also ethnically. And so who goes and who attends which commemorations? Uh, and then I've been mostly focusing on the top down aspect here, but there's a whole level of this bottom up uh, memory uh, initiatives and these non-state memory entrepreneurs. And they're what from veteran organizations to victims groups to also NGOs, uh, to people selling souvenirs at various commemorations. Here's Bleiburg from 2017. Uh, you could completely get decked out uh, in your, your outfit and your tchotchkes and your uh, wall clocks. And I didn't even show the sausage stand and the beer that was being sold there. This has now been banned. And so this is seemingly a thing of the past. And of course, because of the uh, Corona pandemic, this commemoration didn't happen this year at all. But there's a, a whole another set of this business of memory, which is uh, hopefully uh, another project I hope to engage in to look at all these things behind the curtain, you know, who pays to build a monument? Does your cousin have a, a concrete factory, you know, that is gonna build this monument for you in the in the village? And the finally, the third aspect which Vyotza asked us to, to discuss is these NGOs and memory activists. Now, I guess in a way they're also memory entrep entrepreneurs, you know, because they are engaged in this. I mean, because I'm involved with a lot of these groups and I've, uh, led a lot of them. Um, I, I tend to look on them more favor favorably and positively, but, you know, I think uh, scientifically we should, you know, be try to be more objective and analyze all of their roles. But for Croatia, at least, I think it, it does serve a positive role and they have allowed the discussion of, uh, allowed for the discussion of groups that have been either been marginalized or forgotten or suppressed or silenced or even locations that haven't been uh, really dealt with. Like, for example, on the right, we see Goliotok, where I took uh, students several years ago. And I know the NGO Documenta has worked on a lot to create a, a proper memory site on Goliotok. And on the left, we uh, was when we were visiting uh, Vukovar. And this is um, actually the, a museum that's located uh, on this, uh, the museum uh, of the homeland war in Vukovar. So many workshops, summer schools, roundtables, uh, et cetera, which is I think positive and working also with young people because actually with students, when I ask them, are you interested in you know commemorations or the war? Most of them will say, no, we don't care about that. But it's up to us to sort of make it uh, interesting and relevant because I think it is relevant and it is involved in the politics. So the more people can think about it critically, the less ability there is for the state to manipulate it. Um, but that has, we have to like get young people interested in it. And now coming to my conclusion, which despite these divisions and problems and uh, instrumentalization, I think there was a shift in this commemorative culture uh, this summer, and I, I saw that uh, Natasha Kandic and uh, Yelena and maybe some others who were on panels we were on this summer and we were discussing uh, Oluya Operation Storm. 
and we can be, you know, cynical and be say maybe this is not really anything is happening. But I think these were pretty important symbolic moments where, after 25 years, uh, this these, these these traumas from the 1990s, there was an attempt to be inclusive, to really bring together, um, you know, both sides or multiple sides. Uh, to attend these commemorations, whether it was uh, Boris uh, Milosevic, who was in Knin, and then later the, the president and uh, the Minister of Veteran Affairs going to Grubori, a site where Serb civilians were murdered uh, in the aftermath of Operation Storm, the same as Varivode, where uh, the prime minister attended. So these were pretty important moments. And I, there's, there's a lot of, there's criticism from a lot of sides, but I think ultimately this was a positive step forward. And for my last slide, coming up, the commemoration in Vukovar, we'll see how that is gonna go. Is there uh, another moment for recognizing the other victims uh, or all victims, especially civilian victims, uh, you know, without this equating aggressor and victim um, narrative, but really opening it up and having a, a dialogue and allowing families who lost people to uh, remember their, their their loved ones in a dignified uh, manner, and not use these commemorative politics, these memory politics, just for uh, nationalist agendas um, of of uh, various political actors. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, hopefully, I accomplished my mission, Vyolsa. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, Vieron, for taking this. You know, uh, look very much into into the details and and the highlights according to the scheme that I thought it's uh, important to discuss in the in the panel, and yes, and perhaps it's very important to um, also to uh, to build the archive um, of all the um, uh, remembrance uh, practices and also to to look at you know is to reflect on the on the possible changes and uh, what are the new directions is what is the what the future is uh, is ahead so thank you thank you Viera, very much and i i do have questions and i i also think that uh, our our guests in the in, in the panel will have questions uh, questions too so thank you once again and now would like to give floor to now Tranovsky. uh so now please the floor is uh, yours thanks Kjolsa. i hope you can hear me I hear you. Hear you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thanks again for for the invitation. I guess my my role here at this panel session would be to bring in again to the case of North Macedonia in, in the debate. Uh, and practically, I would argue it's a, it's a very timely uh, moment uh, for doing so regarding the recent uh, developments over the two months uh, in the in the state. Uh, so I will briefly try to map them, uh, contextualize them, and kind of provide some sort of framework for better understanding, uh, and illustrate my point with one uh, final, final example of memory activism. Also, as Vieran said, trying to kind of follow the the pattern you you established in the call. Uh, so, just briefly, uh, as you're probably familiar, shortly after the parliamentary elections in 2016 and after the governmental change in 2017, uh, a new government was formed in, in North Macedonia, which uh, resulted into the friendship treaty with uh, the Republic of Bulgaria from August uh, 2017, which was also ratified in January 2018 in both the countries. Uh, and also the treaty came after the 2020 Bulgarian veto to, to North Macedonia start of the EU accession talks. Uh, on the other hand, uh, once signed, the, the friendship treaty paved the way for the so-called PRESPA agreement or the Macedonian Greco-Macedonian agreement from Ju June 2018. The, the full name is, is relatively long. Uh, uh, so an agreement which was signed in June 2018, ratified in January 2019, uh, which settled, as I said, the two decades long name dispute between Greece and North Macedonia nowadays, uh, facilitated uh, North Macedonia's uh, full membership in, into NATO and revived in, in a certain way uh, states EU integrations. So what happened in the last, over the last two months? Uh, in a, in a re re reverse chronology, uh, firstly, it was the Bulgarian Prime Minister Boyko Borisov 
who hinted at the 10th of November uh, as the date of the Berlin Process Summit, which is to be co-chaired by Bulgaria and North Macedonia, as a deadline for settling the, the quarrel over Godzad Delchev, uh, who is a national historical figure whose memory is cultivated in both the countries and considered, of course, important and, 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 and focal, uh, but also is the most recent bone of contention within the Joint Commission. So kind of the Bulgarian Prime Minister, Prime Minister was interpreted within the, the, the public uh, uh, discourse as uh, mostly Macedonian, uh, as imposing an almost inapproachable pace in the work of the commission. Uh, the commission hearing is, 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 uh, is a interstate body uh, uh, um, kind of uh, envisioned with the, with the friendship treaty. Uh, but also what happened afterwards was that uh, um, Macedonian uh, foreign, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Buyar Osmani paid an official visit to Sofia on 9th of October uh while also just a week afterwards on 15th and 16th of october the joint commission on uh, historical and educational issues uh held a uh, held a, a two day meeting almost of almost after one year uh pause caused by the summer electoral electoral cycle in macedonia uh and of course the the, the pandemic uh, but what happened also in the meantime is very interesting for for the the recent developments namely on october on 11th of october uh north macedonia celebrated its annual day of the people's uprising in macedonia in 1941 uh, which is commemorating the partisan insurgents against fascism and serves also as one of the most pertinent uh, post-war uh, national holidays which was in turn interpreted as an anti-bulgarian provocation by a bulgarian member of the european parliament kovacev who is affiliated also with the governmental party, uh, one of the governmental parties in, in Bulgaria. Uh, while on 1st of October, just briefly uh, before, the Bulgarian parliament vote, voted on renaming the official name of the national holiday of 24th of May as a day of Bulgarian letters, education and culture, instead of day of Bulgarian education and culture and the Slavic letters, which in turn, uh, provoked uh, reactions in uh, within the Macedonian uh, uh, camp, who also claim a kind of a legacy over over Cyril and Methodius uh, in this context. Uh, but what mostly kind of let's say shook the the, the bilateral re relations was the first uh, the first uh, maneuver by the Bulgarian side, uh, which issued practically uh, also an ex uh, the full name is is relatively long. Uh, but I will read it. Uh, so it's an explanatory memorandum on the relationship of the Republic of Bulgaria with the Republic of North Macedonia in the context of the EU enlargement and the association and stabilization process uh, in mid-September 2020, uh, which is a six-page long position paper uh, supported by, by all the political parties represented in the Bulgarian National Assembly, which was also circulated within the, the Council of the EU uh, and uh, and provoked massive set of reactions both uh, within the domestic publics, uh, but also but also abroad. Uh, for, for illustration, a counter memorandum was issued shortly afterwards by by uh, Bulgarian uh, also historians and and, and experts. Uh, so just to to take a step back and contextualize what what's what's happening here with all these kind of uh, recent dynamics. Uh, so both the accords uh, amidst the focus on the economic partnership uh, between the signing parties aim at en enhancing good neighborly relations uh, by introducing new paradigms in history education, both the treaties, public memorialization, uh, the greco macedonian or the PRESPA agreement, and joint state commemorations of shared historical figures and event, which is the Bulgarian-Macedonian uh, treaty. Uh, how, how, can, how can we kind of put this whole whole uh, uh, mess in a, in a coordinate system if 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 we can? Uh, well, plastically, uh, I, I can just briefly illustrate it with the with the following the model of of Valerie Rousseau, which is a, a senior fellow at the Belgian National Fund for Scientific Research, which identifies when speaking about the Europeanization of 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 the reconciliatory narratives uh, for two let's say ideal type of approaches: a minimalist one which refers to any mutually conciliatory accommodation of historical narratives. So practically, even so without a reference to this nowadays actual 
uh, agonistic memory. It's kind of uh, allows a, a, a existence of two parallel narratives over over certain historical period of time. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, a maximalist version, which highlights uh, the transcendent nature of a far more demanding process of requiring tr requiring truth, justice, and forgiveness. So practically, goes beyond this kind of uh, two separate narratives. Uh, so of course, in, in the Macedonian case, let's say uh, both the accurates are kind of uh, authentic in their hybridity. Uh, so both have minimalist and maximalist elements. Uh, so starting with the with the Prespa agreement or the or the or the Macedonian Greek agreement, uh, the maximalist here element is the targeting of Skopje 2014 itself. Uh, uh, without uh, without you know having to, to contextualize the the, the this mnemonic uh, in, in, endeavor in a way uh, what happened with after the Prespa agreement was that uh, practically the agreement itself introduced conventional descriptive plaques to the monuments depicting historical figures and events from the Hellenistic period uh, while the minimalist aspect here was uh, the very delineation of the symbolic domains of the signifiers Macedonia and Macedonian within both the Greek and the Macedonian societies. Uh, up until nowadays, for your information, uh, the, the, there was an attempt just recently last month to change the descriptive plaques uh, in, the, in North Macedonia, which was met with, with resentment, uh, uh, counter mobilization, of course, the new plaques, pla uh, the new descriptions were, were vandalized. Uh, while the, the Greco-Macedonian kind of joint committee for, for historical, archaeological and educational affairs uh, also envisioned with the agreement and announced some sort of uh, agreement over the ancient history representations in, in textbooks. Uh, but somehow uh, there, uh, after the, the Greek elections in 2019, uh, there was a shift in the, in the Greek team and, 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 and heretofore not much has been heard from, from their side. Uh, what's interesting here is the Bulgarian and, and North Macedonia's uh, treaty, uh, which of course also contains in a way the two, the two approaches of, uh, uh, depicted by Rousseau. Uh, so on one hand, it had the maximalist approach towards the public state commemorations. And here, for instance, uh, one, can, one can mention the, the first ever official visit of a high ranking Bulgarian politician to a state commemoration uh, of the deportation and the mass murder of the Macedonian Jews in 1943, which actually took place in Skopje in March 2018, uh, which was also kind of criticized uh, as, as Borisov, the Bulgarian prime minister, kind of failed to deliver the much hoped uh, apology for the role of the kingdom of Bulgaria in the tragedy. Uh, so this is one, one kind of uh, uh, event. The second one was the, the fast breakthrough, let's say, uh, in the history textbooks, depictions kind of the joint commission uh, with, a, with a pretty fast pace uh, uh, went over certain historical figures, uh, predominantly from the med medieval history, stopping, of course, uh, uh, at the period formative for the Macedonian nation, nation building, namely the late 19th century. Uh, what's interesting here was the minimalist asset uh, in the Bulgarian Macedonian Treaty, uh, which was from Macedonian side perceived as uh, uh, these very notions of self determination and nation, nation building processes. Uh, so, here, uh, the ethno, let's say, ethno Macedonian identity was at stake, as well as the language. And this was something which was hinted in the Macedonian side as protected uh, and kind of uh, not the subject of negotiations within this shared history discourse. Uh, but what's interesting here uh, is that there is this uh, common fallacy, and this is my argument, I guess, uh, that in the public discourse that uh, this template is a ready-made uh, kind of uh, given, also brokered by the by international uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, which kind of uh, oversees all these dynamic uh, multi-directional aspects which are actually happening in the field. Uh, and what's interesting and uh, with kind of uh, I'm trying to develop in one paper is that there is this common flow scale of, of his, leave the history to the historians, which is kind of repeating uh, uh, since, you know, like 90s, 1950s, 1960s, especially the first Macedonian, uh, then Yugoslav uh, Bulgarian commissions, which were kind of 
uh, having the, the similar discursive scope when discussing the, the, the similar issues. Um, but this is something which is interesting as these memory agents uh, uh, on the ground are practically even setting the agenda for the professional historiography uh, and and kind of trying to uh, what what Anna and Tamar are saying, you know, upload um, uh, a certain various nationalist and exclusivist agendas uh, within this framework of, of European integrations and, and reconciliation even. Uh, so if I briefly may just illustrate with one case study, uh, uh, namely, it's, it's, it's relatively unknown, I believe, uh, that not much has been written, is the case of, of Mara Buneva's commemorations in Skopje. Uh, Mara Buneva uh, was uh, affiliated with the rightist interwar internal Macedonian revolutionary organization. Uh, and she's famous for uh, her assassination of Velmir Prelic in 1928 uh, in Skopje. Uh, who was back then a high rank, ranking uh, representative of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes on the territory of what's today's North Macedonia. Uh, afterwards, she is, uh, she is committing suicide at the very crime scene. Um, and now what's interesting, uh, as of 2001, almost every year on 13th of January, a commemorative plaque dedicated to Buneva is mounted and uh, almost, almost frequently demolished in the very city center of Skopje. Uh, after the after the after the uh, uh, assassination, uh, it was practically uh, the interwar uh, revolutionary organization which endorsed the the deed, uh, and somehow the memory was preserved within this uh, within this organization uh, with with the Bulgarian when I mean uh, uh, during the Second World War and the, the Bulgarian uh, uh, administration in, in in Macedonia, as depicted by the Bulgarian historiography, uh, a memory of Buneva was was uh, erected in at the very assassination spot, which was immediately afterwards uh, uh, demolished, uh, thus sentencing the memory of Buneva to oblivion, as as put uh, by Dimitar Bechev. Likewise, the socialist Macedonian historiography entirely ignored the, 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 the Skopje assassination and treated uh, Buneva as what uh, Keith Brown defines as the symbolic pollution of the national historical canon. So practically, she's, she's a, she's an, it's a non-event. It doesn't exist in the historiography. Uh, but what happens is that uh, in, in the meantime, is that the legacy of Buneva's deed is being preserved within the political diaspora. Uh, and in 1990s, uh, it's uh, the, a Bulgarian political party which kind of claims legacy over over the interwar uh, organization, uh, names its women association Mara Buneva and advocates for a commemorative service in Skopje. Uh, interestingly enough, the party name is, is also VMRO, uh, practically same as, as the Macedonian counterpart. Uh, and what's interesting is that this is very much co co correlated with, with Ivan Vancho Mikhailov, uh, who was one of the leaders of the interwar Vemero, um, plea for you know uh, commemorating Buneva in, in Skopje by the Bulgarian patriotic youth. Uh, so practically up until 2001, there is no event commemorating Buneva in, in Skopje. Uh, but there is an interesting turn and there is a whole history of, of, of these events. There is an interesting turn uh, from the early 90s, 2000s up until the late uh, 2000s and especially 2000, early 2010s when Buneva practically from a non-event, uh, only a media event is being recognized within the Macedonian national canon. Uh, so practically a wax figure is uh, depicting her is being mounted in the newly formed Museum of the Macedonian Struggle in 2010, uh, and somehow various Macedonian patriotic organizations are starting to cele celebrate uh, her revolutionary deed. Uh, very, you know, so, so in several uh, occasions there are like several commemorations uh, uh, at the very spot, uh, uh, parallel to the former groups who were of admirers of Buneva but also Bulgarians, very cross-national type of celebration. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, if, if in the early 2000s, they would usually clash these groups, up, uh, uh, since 2010s, they're somehow starting to, to celebrate uh, 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 Buneva's uh, deed and, and historical figure 
uh, together. And what's interesting, now, <laughs> uh, what's interesting is that one just recently, after the Friendship Treaty, the Bulgarian Cultural Club in Skopje called the locals for a massive at attendance of Buneva's commemoration in the name of the good neighborly relation, relations and the Euro-Atlantic back then, uh, as Macedonia was not a member, uh, a full, full member of, of NATO, so practically in the name of the, 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 jo the joint future in, in EU and NATO. Uh, so here, I guess I would, I would stop. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to questions and I hope I was clear enough in, in what I- uh, Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Naom, and thank you uh, for bringing all this com complexity of the transnational and, uh, and the local and also within the larger European Union frame. And I think that connects very well also with the, with the presentation of, uh, of Anna. So thank you. Uh, we will go to the, our uh, uh, fourth panelist, uh, to Venera. Um, Venera. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, good, good. Uh, so I will have a PowerPoint presentation. Is that okay? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, let me just share screen. Okay. Uh -huh. Can can everybody see everything? Okay. So I will today talk about Kosovo, and I will go through three themes. The first will be the ethno-national framework, and the second theme I will look at the gender dynamics, and lastly I will also show some examples from memory uh, activism in Kosovo. Uh, when we talk about the ethno-national frame framework and memory practice in Kosovo, we cannot uh, avoid the 90s, and uh, we can for sure uh, have enough evidence that the dominant uh, practices is commemorating the uh, Kosovo Liberation uh, Army both in institutional and private remembrance practices. Uh, the narrative that is uh, developed is the, the narrative of heroes. Uh, Kosovo Liberation Army as a group who provided security and peace to Kosovo Albanians in a difficult times, uh, as an enhancer of ethnic, ethnic national belonging, but also as a founding fathers who liberated Kosovo uh, uh, and brought peace. For sure, this in the aftermath was used by political parties. So we have, uh, uh, major political parties using this KLA sentiment and building uh, monuments to, to, Kosovo, to KLA. As well, many KLA members have actually uh, formed or are prominent members of, of, the, of the dominant political parties in Kosovo. So this, this go hand by hand with legal acknowledgement. So the KLA today has a, uh, is, is a prominent acknowledged legal group in Kosovo uh, compared to, let's say, with, with civil victims or survivors in victims of wartime sexual violence. For example, the veterans can, uh, family can inherit uh, the pension uh, if they die, but it's not the same for, for survivors of wartime sexual violence. So this uh, memory dominance is um, very interesting because it shows us all the groups that, that are uh, not dominant or are excluded. So for sure we can uh, conclude that Ethnic non majorities are not so uh, um, uh, visible in Kosovo, in Kosovo public sphere, as well, women who are not part of this, mem uh, this memory of, of, of the military organization. And also, other uh, political movements, resistance, and organizations that were outside of the uh, KLA um, uh, uh, umbrella. So, I just, uh, yeah, I put a few examples of institutional initiatives. So this is, for example, uh, the Zahar Pajaziti Square in Pristina. And Zahar Pajaziti was a famous KLA commander. But it's interesting that in every Kosovo city, you, ha you have a, a, similar, a similar square like this. Uh, and next to, the, to, to it, we have the Adam Yashari Youth and Sports Center in Pristina that was built during the socialist time. So uh, the original name was uh, honoring the two partisans, Boro and, uh, and Ramis, to symbolize the ideology of brotherhood and unity. But today uh, the name has changed and it is called uh, Adam Yashari, uh, honoring the uh, founder of, uh, of the Kosovo Liberation uh, Army. But here we can also 
maybe explore uh, more and we can see that many streets and schools uh, have have been uh, uh, having the name of uh, Ademia, Ademia Shari. Uh, for example, even beyond the institutional initiatives such as the airport of Kosovo, etc. But uh, all that you know, I assume you know the Ademia Shari uh, 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 tragic story and the family of the, of the Yashari is that more than 50 um, uh, member of his family died when he died. But however, the, the, uh, his family members, uh, the women, the children are not so much uh, commemorated in public space as, as the Kosovo Liberation Army founder. So the one thing that is also interesting for uh, Kosovo, we have a lot of private initiatives. So family members uh, uh, building uh, monuments for, the, for their um, uh, uh, family losses. So this one I took from, uh, from my surroundings. This is from the village in Jonai, which is where my parents uh, originally come from. So we can see uh, on the left, the private monument that was erected this year by the Resha Socha family. It was a KLA, KLA soldier. And uh, in the right, we can see there is also a cultural center called uh, Resha Socha in our small, uh, small village near, uh, near, near, near Prizren. So it's interesting to see how both the private and public initiatives uh, uh, blend with each other. Um, when we, public interventions are quite important, especially uh, when, it, when, we, when we are talking and discussing how to cha challenge, how to include something uh, 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 outside of this dominant uh, ethno-national framework. This is an uh, example uh, of the uh, commemorative plaque in Mitrovica. So this year, uh, the municipality of Mitrovica uh, honored the, uh, the civilian who, who, were, who were bombed in green market in Mitrovica. So in the first picture, originally we can see that only six names that were included. They were all Albanian names. And after a thorough research by a local researcher here in Kosovo, Shkezengashi, it was discovered that the seventh victim was a, a, a young uh, a Roma, Roma uh, girl and that her name was not included in this plaque by the municipality of uh, Mitrovica. This evoked a huge uh, public discussion and debate. And we can see in the second picture that local citizens have put a paper saying, in this place, the name of Elizabeth Hassani should be. And uh, after public reacted and, and different expectation why this happened, uh, finally, the municipality of Mitrovica has apologized and removed the uh, this plaque and put a, a new plaque with the name uh, of Elisabetta Asani. So this is one of the very recent uh, examples to see how can the public and how can the local people engage with uh, public public institutions and make an uh, impact. However, it will be more much better if the municipality of Mitrovica uh, didn't um, uh, originally have put her, her, her name and didn't go through this uh, public public debate. Uh, talking with, about gender and memory, it's obvious that women are underrepresented uh, in memory practices in Kosovo as well in the region. Uh, the recent effort that, uh, that happened in Kosovo are mostly focused on wartime sexual violence. And this is making Kosovo one of the first countries in the region to actually recognize wartime sexual violence via uh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, memory memory practices. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, these are the two examples. We still we still see that um, uh, survivors are not speaking, but monuments are politicians and NGOs are speaking in their name. So it's interesting for us to unpack what they actually mean. So we have the, here two initiatives, Heroina and. Uh, uh, Heroina Monument and uh, the installation Thinking of You, that were both, uh, both uh, uh, inaugurated in 2015. The Heroina Monument, uh, uh, it was very interesting. It was a parliamentary initiative from, the, from Al Malama, uh, who was a deputy at that time. And it, uh, it represented 20,000 uh, women who experienced wartime sexual uh, violence, but also it has a secondary message to acknowledge the woman experience and contribution uh, in Kosovo war, even though that, that part is quite uh, uh, ambiguous, not very uh, clarified by the author. Uh, why, why is it, 
we see that this is still um, under uh, this ethno-national framework because it doesn't it doesn't challenge in the sense that uh, the technology is victims from uh, non-majority groups. It's still a heroina, it's still an Albanian language, but it's also quite biological in the sense that we have one face with 20,000 prints. So we are kind of biologically trying to imagine how, how an Albanian uh, a wo a woman should uh, look like. Uh, uh, as well, installation taking a few uh, supported by the uh, office of the president uh, Yahyaga, with the uh, is, is involving the artist Alke Tamri Pajafa. Interesting installation uh, went on uh, three languages: in, in Albanian, Serbo Croatian, and uh, in English. Uh, but it's uh, quite uh, on the playing the gender roles since uh, citizens were bringing uh, dresses or skirts. Uh, uh, to represent uh, the voices of uh, of the of the survivors, so not actually uh, uh, challenging gender gender uh, gender roles. Uh, as well, uh, as often we see that when we talk, we usually talk in Kosovo about uh, Albanian and Serbian relationship relationships and etc. And we somehow forget to to mention uh, other other non majority community in Kosovo as Roma, Shkali, Egyptian, Turks, and Bosniaks. Uh, and this year, uh, one of the most famous uh, monument in Pristina is the newborn monument. It represents the, uh, the newborn state in, in Kosovo. So uh, every day on the uh, Independence Day, the newborn monument is painted with new theme. And it's a big um, event in Kosovo, as many volunteers come and paint, paint the monument. And the next day, we see, uh, we see, we see the theme, the, the surprise. So this year, the monument was, uh, the theme was wartime sexual violence, dedicated to all victims of sexual abuse during the conflict around the world, uh, but focusing on the, on the, uh, 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 on Kosovo, as the narratives you can see in English uh, uh, were painted on the monument, somewhere in Albanian, somewhere in English, but not so much from, uh, from uh, uh, other non-majority languages. This was, yes, under the campaign, Be My Voice. You can see a lot of media, children playing, playing around it, and, and the narratives of the, of the victim. I will briefly also talk about memory activism that was, again, mostly focused to kind of challenge uh, the idea that victims uh, were, uh, were not only Albanian, yes, predominantly, but also, also other ethnic, ethnic groups. So for sure, the most famous traditionally now is um, uh, when, when we mark the International Day of Enforced Disappearance, the Tutan of Kosovo. Uh, so this, the, the idea to put all the names of the victims uh, uh, with no, no ethnic, uh, ethnic discrimination. And as well, um, to mention the exhibition Once Upon a Time and Ever Again by Humanitarian Law Center Kosovo, as a good ex uh, example, it's an exhibition that uh, is focused only on the loss uh, and the uh, uh, human loss and missing uh, of children in Kosovo. Uh, uh, and it's a good uh, example since they also cooperated with the municipality of Pristina. So how can, for example, uh, civil, civil society make this uh, more um, multi-narrative uh, practices into more, uh, into to become institutional? Uh, uh, and for sure, many, many, many students uh, around Kosovo had the chance to see this uh, exhibition. Why is this important? And here how I will a little bit conclude with this is because the current pre-university textbooks are, are one narrative oriented or may, maybe better to say it uh, contains uh, some misleading uh, uh, information. For example, this is a quote from the history textbook uh, for the 10th grade uh, in Kosovo, which says only during the months of NATO air bombing and Serbian army killed above 50,000 Albanians. The number is, slight, is uh, slight, uh, slightly lower, and however, it was not only Al uh, uh, Albanians, for sure, there were also other ethnic groups. Um, moving forward, why, the, why, why memory is so important to study and why are the debates um, more than ever important on this, uh, is the idea of uh, freedom of speech, of can you actually open some, some topics uh, on this issue? So, for example, I, I put here the Shkezengashi. Uh, he was an uh, advisor to the prime, min prime minister at that time, Alibin Kurti, who in one interview said, uh, uh, 
individual individuals in the Kosovo Liberation Army might have committed some war crimes. Uh, he was uh, uh, calling on the uh, findings in international reports of Charles Human Rights Watch. And he was publicly lynched as someone who uh, is anti-Albanian to someone who doesn't have uh, 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 respect, uh, despite of him being very, very concise in his uh, uh, deliberation. Uh, and as a result, he was he was removed from from the advisory post uh, at the uh, Kosovo government. So it, it speaks a lot how how difficult it is actually to challenge uh, this dominant uh, memory on Kosovo Liberation uh, Army. And if you go back uh, here, we see uh, the banner which is now in in the square of Pristina, which says heroes of the war and peace. And we see the current president, uh, Hashim Thaci and Kadri Veseli, who is the, uh, the uh, PDK party leader. Uh, so, uh, and, and we see the UCK, UCK uh, logo. For sure that this uh, KLA sentiment is, is, is powerful and it is, is being politically uh, used, especially now when the, when the special court uh, uh, is, uh, be, is working on particular cases, uh, and as a result, then we have all, uh, we had uh, from the same party an attempt to push the draft law and protection Kosovo Liberation Army war values, and uh, locally the Kosovo public, but as well the international community, uh, rejected this law publicly, saying that it's not good for the freedom of speech, and it didn't pass. But all in all, uh, uh, despite um, uh, uh, some effort of memory activism and to recognize uh, gender, it's still difficult to include multi-narrative remembrance initiative that will actually challenge the, this ethno-national uh, framework. So that's it, and I look uh, forward um, uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Venera, for bringing gender into our discussion and analysis of memory politics and practices of remembrance. Um, that's very uh, important topic, definitely, and also for you know, as previous speakers have pointed out, to the you know inclusions and exclusions within the larger memory memory practice and remembrance uh, practices. So I see that we we have 14 minutes to go to the uh, conclude the panel. So I would like to give um, uh, the chance to the uh, participants in the panel. Uh, to the audience to have questions. So please feel free to use your uh, camera and, to, and speak uh, if you would like to pose a question or just to uh, use chat uh, to address questions to our uh, uh, panelists. Do we have any, any questions? Okay, so while we are waiting for questions from the uh, from the audience, uh, perhaps I would like to we all agree to go uh, just to have a one short round of of questions. I would like to start with Anna. Uh, if you could just perhaps find one or two examples of how this selective appropriation of EU uh, memory norms are being uh, practiced uh, currently in the Western, uh, Western Balkans. And also perhaps very briefly about, you said that there is no common European, um, European memory. Uh, what does this mean in the context of the European Union today and also for the, for the future? I know these are two big questions, but please, yes. Let's let's unmute first. So I like challenging questions. So I will I would like to start with a challenging question. Um, so what I said actually, there is no European memory. So there is no one unifying narrative about what the past was um, in, in in the European Union. Um, and when we talk about the examples, there are so many examples of how this European memory framework that is agreed minimum common denominator 
of the past in European Union. So there are a number of examples how this um, EU memory framework has been downloaded in the countries of the Western Balkans. And of course, uh, one uh, example that comes to my mind is the one of um, uh, the Srebrenica genocide. And the fact that the European Union and especially the European Parliament have been asserting a certain sort of a pressure uh, to Serbia to acknowledge uh, what actually happened in, in Srebrenica. So um, everybody who has been researching memory politics in Serbia or a memory politics at European level knows that um, the European Parliament made a resolution, a number of resolutions actually to um, kind of uh, provide support for the victims' families um, of the Srebrenica genocide. And that they, by making this resolution on European level, try to uh, make sort of a pressure uh, on Serbia to recognize actually what happened there. So we also know that this didn't work. So in a certain at a certain point of time, the Serbian parliament did kind of made a sort of a resolution that kind of sees um, uh, Srebrenica events um, as something that was wrong, but they never recognized it as a genocide. So why they did it? Why they did it? Why they? It, it, because it, it's um, it was unnatural. Um, it was not something that they um, actually that, that goes uh, in line with the, the official memory politics of Serbia. Why they did it? They did it because they wanted to accelerate uh, the date for getting the the um, the uh, the EU uh, approval. Uh, for moving uh, faster on the EU track. So um, this is one of the examples, uh, and, but there are a number of examples how this downloading actually happens um, in a number of countries, uh, which actually leads me to the point that I am really, really, really skepti skept skeptical um, about the success of memor memorialization actually to induce some kind of symbolic justice and reparation uh, for the victims, for the local communities. Um, I'm really, really skeptical, skeptical uh, about that. So I think also there is a, a lack of research actually um, on this topic of actually uh, of the popularity of memory as a tool of symbolic justice and reparation. And the efficacy of this kind of um, various types of memorialization um, in transitional justice and all sorts of uh, post-traumatic settings. Um, uh, I'm really... Yeah, so Vieran is offered a more optimistic um, <laughs> outlook, right Vieran? Yeah. Um, because you detect a, a nuance of a shift in the public discourse in terms of me memorialization and remembrance practices in uh, in Croatia, but also in in, in Arms presentation, also you detect this. You know, there is a gloomy side to to all of that. That there is not that optimistic uh, uh, perception of the optimism about how to to move forward and how to. Uh, you know, that this dynamic between inclusion and exclusion is really very much uh, uh, on the on the other side. So in the, on the exclusion or in within the ethno-national uh, framework, as also Venera presented the case for Kosovo. So perhaps maybe Vieran can, can give us a little bit of this optimistic optimism and hope perhaps <laughs> into this. Yeah. Uh, and then we can take it to, to Naum and to, to Venera to perhaps to go another uh, uh, this is there, what is there uh, in terms of future and uh, optimism about the memory uh, commemoration practices in the, in the Western Balkans. Yes. Yeah. yeah, during the summer for the Operation Storm uh, roundtable, I was also the optimistic one and uh, my colleague Sven, he was, he was very pessimistic. So, I mean, the, the argument would be, okay, so who cares? Some politicians showed up at a commemoration and they don't come back. And the, is there any really practical things going going done after that? But, you know, I think the symbolic, symbolic politics does have a, an impact. I mean, okay, with Ivo Josipovic several years ago, it didn't really go anywhere. And then Serbian Croatian relations got worse. So you could then say, okay, it doesn't really have a long-term effect. But if it's supported by then like, more local initiatives and actually they were saying they will not only just show up to Grubori and lay a wreath, but then bring electricity and really encourage um, 
uh, Serbs who were living in Serbia that were from there to come back. You know, it has to be matched by actual, uh, you know, local initiatives and uh, on the ground. But, you know, if it generates some kind of positive atmosphere, then maybe, um, you know, other things can riff off of it, whether it's uh, more activists or uh, academics and so on. I mean, I've been working with colleagues in Croatia for 10 years, having conferences about Serb-Croatian relations and nothing has happened. And then it sometimes takes uh, from the, 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 the top to move forward. Now, let's see what happens with Vukovar. As I, as I mentioned, it's coming up in a few weeks. And there were some from the right wing saying, we don't want Vukovar to be another Knin. We don't want the state telling us how we should commemorate. So again, let's say I'm cautiously optimistic and pushing forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Now, and then Venera. Yes. Yeah, just briefly, I can add upon uh, this, uh, practically again, illustrating with some sort of alternative history of the of the Macedonian-Bulgarian relations in the past two decades. Uh, namely, I mean, I tried to kind of show uh, that there is this, uh, let's say, rightist mobilization on the ground. It's practically similar, the similar groups which are, uh, you know, like kind of, they were facilitating the process of commemorating uh, Buneva in Skopje, but they were also active in this look of March commemorations in, in, in Bulgaria, uh, which is nowadays pretty, pretty gaining traction. I mean, uh, in a way, uh, as some one of the most, let's say, massive uh, far rightist manifestations in, in Southeastern Europe. But nevertheless, there is an alternative hi history to this, even more optimistic one, one if I may. Uh, namely, there are this, all these e events and, and initiatives practically uh, state-sponsored, but to a certain extent also bottom-up, which are kind of failing to, to attach to this kind of right now contemporary discourse on, on reconciliating and having this kind of historical uh, shared past and, 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 and so on. Uh, so here I would just mention uh, a very interesting initiative which I, which I came across when, when researching for the Republic of Days uh, in, in North Macedonia commemorations, namely Ilinden in Macedonian, Saint El Elijah Day. Uh, and uh, somehow I was trying to, to see how these memory regimes are, were changing in the course of two decades over the, over the past. And there is a very interesting episode from 2003, when actually without a, a visible uh, EU pressure in a way, uh, the, the, the then president Boris Strykovsky kind of tried to reimagine the commemoration as some sort of a platform for the regional uh, aspiration to show the regional aspiration of EU. Uh, so he invited for the first time a Bulgarian counterpart. Um, and it's something which nowadays is being problematized as Ilinden is, is kind of uh, discursively reimagined as being a shared, uh, a shared uh, national holiday. That's one thing, and also, I mean, I'm, I also kind of like such initiatives, and I just also recently came across a Wikipedia kind of series of of of, um, of uh, seminars, cross-border seminars, where actually in early 2000s there was a Macedonian-Bulgarian commission, informal, of course, which actually managed managed to put formulas, put forward formulas of depicting this most heated nowadays historical uh, of figures, Gotze Delchev being the, one of them. Uh, and it's something, of course, which had a short life, life lifespan and, and somehow got got trolled pre, pre, pretty pretty fast by by party bots. Uh, so yeah, there are there are uh, initiatives, there are of course uh, happenings and occurrences, and it's practically let's say up to us to map them and to and to somehow put them in a, in a, in a some sort of framework. Framework. Thank you. Thank you, Nam. Venera, you uh, if you would like to. Say something optimistic. <laughs> if you it, it, yeah, it's it's very hard, honestly, knowing that uh, on institutional level the history textbooks are dividing and polarizing on ethnic uh, lines. So as long as uh, that is happening, uh, all this positive memory instances of memory activism are great for a, for a, for a debate, but how much they have impact to younger generation who actually doesn't remember anything from the nineties for me as an example so uh, that, that's that's what's uh, uh, what is the the most most uh, problematic uh, thing but also in uh, in this um, let's say reconciliation projects uh, we, we saw 
recently in the published research from, from Gashi, for the joint history project textbook that Again, there was uh, some misleading interpretations how, uh, about Co Kosovo and the Albanian position in, in former in former Yugoslavia. So uh, I, I I don't have really a clear clear answer, but as long as we are talking about these things, I, I think it's good. No, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you all panelists for uh, superb uh, presentations and for giving us lots of your thinking, parts of your research. Uh, and also answering questions on what would be the, the, some of the directions in memory politics and um, remembrance practices. And here I think all of you touched upon the, the relevant importance of education, of research, but also of um, uh, ma maintaining the public sphere uh, that is inclusive and that different narratives and different experiences are being discussed in an, in an open and democratic way. So to conclude this, that yes, memory of politics and remembrance practices as a tool for greater democratization of our, uh, of our societies. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you also on behalf of the Humanitarian Law Center. And I hope we will, be, uh, we will meet again soon at some other events that we will be organized by Humanitarian Law Center Kosovo and also jointly with uh, with Recon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. And I'm